Okay, welcome everybody. This is Cyberbulls. It's going to be a really fun show today. Yesterday, Jensen Huang, CEO of NVIDIA, was out in his conference and he said a, a number of things that are quite positive about Tesla. Specifically, he said that Tesla is a leader in full self-driving and there's also a number of nuggets that he dropped. We've got Matt Smith joining us. Uh, he's from Rebellion Air Investment Advisory Firm. We've got Jeff Lutz. He's one of the regular bulls here. The company and the product don't look at the quarterly stock movement. A very realistic bull, questioning certain decisions. The rational bull, they enjoy listening to bears. They're looking for the red flags. You're supposed to react. Thank you, guys. Let's start off with you first. Jeff, you dropped this. Quite interesting what Jensen Huang was saying. Introduce us and tell us what he said. Yeah, he was interviewed post earnings. First off, the NVIDIA earnings, the Super Bowl. Uh, I think of earnings for the earnings season. Everybody's looking forward to it. I think I joke like everybody and their their mother had a you know had a pregame or had a had an earnings kind of uh, call like going along with the actual uh, Nvidia earnings call to cover it. And boy, did they! I mean, they delivered top line, bottom line, incredible growth. Um, there's even people that are like, oh, well, you know, the the size of the beat is not as big as the size of the beat before. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think you can find and when you have amazing earnings like that, I think you can find something anywhere. Uh, and then they're going to, they're going to split their stock. I think they're increasing their dividend. I mean, it's just all around, just throwing off tremendous amounts of cash, the growth and net income. So it was a really good earnings call. I, what struck me and we can, you know, when we get into this clip, there's two kind of parts to it. One is, um, they, they start off their earnings call and they named out kind of their top five customers and they named out, uh, they named uh, XAI and Tesla and they called out Tesla in terms of really driving that, that GPU cluster growth uh, on the network infrastructure side for, for training for full self-driving. And, you know, that was called out, you know, on the earnings call because here's what I believe, and this is, and we can debate this. I believe that they see Tesla's progress in FSD and, and while Tesla is doing the, the inference side in the vehicle and they're doing all their own software, right? This isn't a, you know, a, a, they're doing their own, all their own software from the ground up. And, and then NVIDIA, I think NVIDIA will say, Hey, we're part of this thing. Like we're powering, this is powered by NVIDIA in terms of the, uh, the network infrastructure side and the training. So I, I, I think they want their name tied to this. And I think this is, a uh, to me, this is kind of telling that they see the progress, they see how far Tesla is ahead, and they know, you know, less than 80 days, there's this robo-taxi announcement coming. And so I, now I think you have the biggest, which is probably gonna be the biggest company in the world here pretty soon, wanting to tie themselves even closer to Tesla. And then you know, Jensen Wong was interviewed right after earnings. And in this clip, you know, this really short clip, you can see what he says about Tesla and their full self-driving effort. It's now the largest vertical, enterprise vertical, within data center. You talked about the Tesla business, but what is that all about? Is it, is it self-driving among other automakers too? Are there other functions that automakers are using um, within data center? Help us understand that a little bit better. Well, Tesla is far ahead in self-driving cars, um, but every single car someday will have to have autonomous capability. It's it's safer. It's more convenient. It's more more fun to drive, and in order to do that, uh, it is now very well known, very well understood, that learning from video directly is the most effective. Why why was it cut, Jeff? <laughs> learning oh, from video know. directly is. <laughs> He's about to drop an f bomb. I think. He's basically <laughs> saying learning from video is the most effective way. Um, to get this done, and that's going to need significant amount. Of, he's basically drawing it back to his business. You're going to need a significant amount of capacity on the um, on the training side to enable it. Okay, what do you think, uh, Matt? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty interesting hearing Jensen call them out. I mean, some people might view them as competitors because they've been talking about kind of advancing some solutions. Uh, but I think, as Jeff alluded to, that's mostly on the inference side. Um, if anyone really wants to compete with Tesla, though, it's hard to imagine how they'll do that uh, without a massive GPU cluster, which 
is, as uh, Jeff also pointed out, is uh, directly a, a, a very nice positive to NVIDIA. Um, I just don't know how other companies are going to do this. I mean, I keep trying to test my own bull hypothesis around there. Like if somebody wants to compete and, and do this, maybe in 10 years or so, all this will become a lot cheaper and, and a company can do it uh, more cost effectively. Um, but if anyone wants to compete in, in the next five years, um, I, I, how do you not only get the cluster up and running, but like have the, the capable AI talent to actually drive this? And the biggest piece of all, I think, is where are you going to get the data from? Um, so even if, you know, GM or whoever wanted to, to launch this right now, they don't have a, a, like a stream of, of vehicles of millions of vehicles with clips that they can pull to actually put into the cluster. Um, so I, I think none of the three components that you need, the talent, the cluster and the, the, the um, data from your, from your fleet, like nobody else has that. So, so I, I do think, uh, a licensing deal at some point is, is going to be the only way that these companies can really do it unless there is some other, you know, approach altogether, which, which also seems unlikely to me. The way I'm looking at it, right. So NVIDIA is just skyrocketing. It's a, it's the darling of wall street. It's going to be, you know, trillions of dollars It's going to become the largest company in the world. that's on its track to do that. And that's because it's the picks and shovels. So every company is buying their chips and servers and, you know, the, the systems that they have. But do you guys agree though, that eventually it's actually the end of the rainbow, it's the gold, it's going to be the real world uses of why people are buying this, you know, compute power, right? It's going to be robo taxi. It's going to be the bot. It's going to be energy and everything else that's going to come out of this, like the, you know, the actual use cases. So at some point, yeah, this is a darling today, NVIDIA, but eventually it's going to be the actual end, you know, product that's going to be I don't know. You tell me, is it going to equivalent? Is it going to eclipse it? And so that's why he's doing this, right? He's saying, Hey, look, we're selling this compute. Here's XAI, which I think he also made a comment, right? That it's one of the biggest uh, buyers the, the last quarter. And then here's Tesla's uh, full self-driving and eventually all cars will have to do this. So he's giving them the tools, but don't you think that eventually Tesla's robo taxi is going to be, you know, pretty, Pretty big size market. What do you guys think about that? So let's get with you, Jeff. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a great debate around um, AI and on, on the training side versus you know the inference or perception side. And where's the biggest business? You've seen a lot of the major OEMs go after and and try to figure out how to do inference chips, and some of them are like Tesla is one example uh, of that. And I, I think those. You know, in my personal opinion, I think you have the opportunity on the inference side to make a gigantic business. Let's just take Optimus, for example. You on, on that side of the equation, you have, I mean, you if you deploy hundreds of millions of robots, um, you know, on that on that you know kind of that monthly or leasing basis, you you can create a, a gigantic business. And on the training side, you know, there's a business there as well. But so I. I mean, I think there, that the, this debate will rage on for a while, and I think there's good points on either side of it. But in terms of creating solutions that you know hit you know, that actually work for an end business or an end consumer, you really have to understand the inference and the perception side. And I think this is what gives Tesla an exa uh, a an advantage over a company like uh, Nvidia. You know, is again, Nvidia does not sell a vehicle to millions of consumers tesla does and and as and matt eloquently said like it's hard to imagine like who is going to in the auto business that's going to step up and create this training cluster who's going to who's going to get who's going to gather this amount of data and and under what cost structure are they going to do it and by when and this whole you know this cost structure to achieve these certain you know bits of functionality through ai it costs a certain amount of money today and then you have to turn that into a business so tesla has to turn this into an fsd or robo taxi business otherwise this you know ten, tens of billion dollars of investment is going to be a problem so this is the chicken and egg thing this is you know this is where you have to go kind of go back and forth with like can can the business be created that's going to support all this training all this spend all this investment this debate's happening on the language model side right now because, you know, there's it's not necessarily clear. Like, does someone have a clear lead uh, in in that? And and people are just kind of popping up all over the place. So, in long story short, I think this debate's going to go on for a while. 
And if you come up with a really interesting thing on the perception side, on the inference side, you have an opportunity that you could eclipse, you know, something on the training side for sure. But I mean, right now, NVIDIA is dominating. Uh, and I would say, and, 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 and they're, they're, they're really dominating on the, on the inference side too. Uh, again, outside of certain companies like Tesla. Um, but I mean, for the foreseeable future, they're going to continue to dominate. But I think this debate back and forth is going to go on for a while between inference and, and training and, and where the money is. Uh, what do you guys think about this argument that some people are saying that, did you not know that NVIDIA has an autonomous vehicle uh, division and that they're going to wipe out Tesla? And so when you hear you know, Jensen Huang say something like that, it makes you realize that, uh, you know, yes, they're providing, you know, the, the compute power to autonomous vehicles. Let's take a look at this and then see what you guys think, right? This is, uh, you know, NVIDIA's website. Better allow that. And so it says self-driving vehicles, right? Accelerating the future of AI-defined vehicles. And they've got in-vehicle computing, infrastructure, safety, their partners, and end-to-end -end autonomous vehicle development platform. Can you guys see this? Yeah. NVIDIA Drive is what it's called. That's the specifically designed compute power for the AV fleet. In-vehicle in AI computing. So they're providing this, the hardware as well. AI infrastructure. Autonomous vehicle safety. And I'm trying to look at the partners here. Let's take a look at the partners. Uh, I mean... Looks like it's generic. Hold on. Oh, there you go. He, he, Look at that. He's referenced like up to 80 partners. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they they look like they're not I mean, BYDs there, right? Hyundai. Okay. What, what's what your take on, on this? self-driving vehicles? Some of these I just don't <laughs> understand. Yeah. What's your take on that, Matt? What's going on here? Well, I, I mean... I think it's really important to um, distinguish training from uh, inference and uh, like pretty much every car company out there knows that like having playing an autonomous is, is like going to be the future. So that's why you see GM going down the cruise route and, you know, the Ford has this blue cruise thing. Um, and, and all those need some, some inference compute of some, uh, of some form or, or another. Um, so I think, NVIDIA is just frankly very happy to, to sell that compute to whoever wants them. Um, but the, the kind of current long list of potential customers doesn't do anything to tell you which ones are going to succeed, which ones ha like have the right um, uh, set of uh, like the entire uh, product set. Th those three pillars that I was talking about earlier apply uh, to anyone playing in the space, whether you're, you know, Neo or, you uh, uh, Continental was one of the ones I saw in there. Um, so I think NVIDIA, it's in their interest to sell compute and for inference compute to whoever wants some. Um, but I, I, I don't think the fact that there's so, so many players playing in that space um, does much to tell you about uh, which ones are going to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, where point. do the priorities come from, Herbert? I mean, there's a list of yeah. what, 80 partners on there. What, what, What's prioritized? I, I think at any one point in time, the head of the autonomy program at Tesla could say, I need this by this, and he can make a decision. And, and you, there's a hardware lead, there's a software lead. Like they can make decisions that go all the way down to the base layer of silicon, all the way back up to you know the sensor in the vehicle, and they can control that whole end-to-end -end stack. Here you've got you go, you've got people developing you know developing the vehicle itself. You have Nvidia developing. The solution yes there's a development kit i know how this works uh and, and so forth but it, it's it's not it's not easy and if you have the capability on the oem side to do the silicon work uh number one you you are going to probably and if you know what you're doing you're going to develop a better system lower latency better performance and you're it's going to work better for for you and your your product and most importantly you're not going to be paying nvidia 70 percent gross margin to get it yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I was thinking about is like, if you're making a decision for, you know, GM or Ford or one of these companies, like, you know, you've got to do something, right? So like you'll launch a, launch a partnership with somebody who seems promising. 
Um, cause if you, you don't want to talk to your investors and say, oh yeah, we don't have a plan or like, we just don't think it's going to work. But I, I think what that incentivizes is like some half measures where, you know, you can say like, oh, like it works really well on these like 1000 miles of highway and, and nowhere else. Um, so I think you've got a lot of these, um, systems in place right now where some companies have solved for kind of local maximums on the path to autonomy. And, you know, all the MBAs running these companies can say, yeah, look, like we're, we're on the path. We're getting better all the time. You know, we're, we've got partnership with NVIDIA. We've got a partnership with, you know, Cruise or AV Go or whatever the company is. And like, you'll be able to have all the right talking points. And if somebody doesn't know any better, um, they'll be like, yeah, okay. Like you're doing all the right things that a, a company should, but they're, they're never going to get to the point where you can solve like, uh, all driving conditions um, in all different roads in all different um, like that's the the path that Elon set out many years ago. He's like, this is like the harder path is to solve um, vision based perception extremely well. I remember him saying this so vividly because it was core to my investment thesis. It's like we must solve uh, vision extremely well, and at the point at which you solved it well, what is the point of having lidar? So I I think like his vision from so long ago. Now, granted, he's extremely late, like he was overly optimistic, all that stuff we know. But I think his vision uh, from that long ago is still kind of bearing fruit. And it's why Tesla is in this position right now where sure, lots of people are competing in the space, but nobody's doing it. Um, nobody took the hard path that Tesla took um, on this front. <laughs> You're mixing up your metaphors. <laughs> Elon decided to go vision only instead of LiDAR, but then Elon also has his vision, right? <laughs> um, you know, when oh, people I didn't, say, I didn't realize. I was like, what did I mix up? That's not a mix up. This is funny. But uh, when people are telling me, you know, they go, did you know NVIDIA has all these partners? NVIDIA has an autonomous vehicle program. All true. But do you know who is th probably the largest partner that NVIDIA has? It's very likely going to be Tesla. It's Elon Musk, X and XAI and Tesla. Uh, Jeff, can you talk a little bit about what is Tesla's and X and XAI's relationship with NVIDIA? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, I, and, you know, in my past, I've worked with NVIDIA as well. Uh, when, when they actually their entry into the smartphone, we did an exclusive with them and uh, very experienced, very good team to work with. And I think from Tesla's perspective, you know, this is a very tricky relationship right now because Tesla is developing, there's, there's no um, ambiguity around what Tesla is developing and working on. Uh, but I think Elon's been very careful in, in, uh, about how he talks about the performance of Dojo, its probability of success and so forth. And uh, it's a very interesting, I, if I were on, you know, on either side of this relationship, it's a very tricky thing to manage. There's mutual respect um, between both. And uh, Tesla needs NVIDIA silicon. They need the H100s. They need the, the, the Blackwells that are coming. They, and they've, they've ordered. They need them uh, both on the, the XAI side as well as the Tesla side. And, uh, and, and it's, you know, they need as many as they can as quickly as they can uh, because they have the access to the data both, you know, from, from X as well as all the driving data that they have and they've got to be able to process it and the faster they can do it and the more data they can process the better their system is so this is a race it's a very tricky relationship to, to manage but i think elon's doing managing it well i think jensen's managing it well because when you're on the inside of this there's a lot of different things at play one is around pricing um two is around uh, allocation this whole you may have heard Jensen talking about it on the, like, how do you manage? Like, you know, and he goes, well, we try to do the best for all of our customers, but in the end, he, he, he actually does have to go into a conference room and sit there and say, meta meta wants this many this month. XAI wants this many this month. They both put their orders in the same time. Who are you giving them to Jensen? And he's got to be able to make those decisions. And there's a number of factors that go into making those allocation decisions. Uh, but he's got to be able to make those decisions. So that's what's happening right now. NVIDIA's got a new product, Blackwell. They've got another new product that will come after that. And what they said on their earnings call was interesting. They're, and it kind of put a lot of people at ease. I think when he said this, the, the stock took another leg up in after hours, which is basically like, look, we are uh, supply constrained. 
and uh, for the foreseeable future. And what's really happening is what I my takeaway was H100s are coming into some level of equ- equilibrium. Yes, they've still got a, a, a whole load of them. They've got a, you know and many customers they've got to work with. And yes, they're probably still on some allocation, but the lead time has come down. So when he says they're supply constrained, when you have a new product introduction, like in this case, the, the, the Blackwell solution, the H200s um, and beyond, the B200s, that whole family, when you have this new solution ramping, you are always constrained for some period of time because you're basically going from zero to some peak run rate. And they're going to be in that window for some period of time. So I know it's a long answer, but long story short, it's a tricky relationship. I think they're both managing it well. I think NVIDIA is going to be constrained for some period of time. They're going to be on allocation. And therefore, Elon and 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 Jensen, it's, they've got to be able to manage this. Elon's going to be able to manage this relationship where it's like, hey, we're working on this stuff internally. At the same time, we really need you as a partner. And I think NVIDIA needs Tesla as a partner. NVIDIA needs partners that get product to market that monetize AI. I think that piece is important as well. Yeah, that's my point. And they are friends. They've been longtime friends. And so I think that when, you know, Elon said, no, Meta's number one in this one chart that uh, they showed earlier, Meta was number one, Tesla was number six. And he, Elon replied saying, actually, that's false. We are number two and XAI is number three. It's because (laughs) Elon picks up the phone, makes a phone call. He's good friends with Jensen. Uh, you know, so far, that's what we're seeing. I don't know if they see each other as competitors, Jeff. I just, I, I don't think at this point that they are going to be competitors in the future. I honestly think that Tesla's focus is so into monetizing AI. It's a perfect synergistic relationship, honestly. And if once, once uh, the real world AI is monetized, even more you know, at that point, you know, this frenzy is going to even just be another magnitude because people are realizing, yes, you can actually make money out of this right now. We don't know yet, right? It's still quite there. I think there there is some level of, of competition, though. I mean, you can imagine, for example, a scenario where the market kind of realizes that Tesla's approach is the right one and they essentially just opt to license FSD from Tesla. So that mm-hmm. would essentially um, eliminate a lot of the inference compute needs um, that NVIDIA has, and then also all those kind of future hopes for uh, some of the big OEMs building out training clusters uh, mm. could, could also go out the window. So, you know, I, I think it is, it's a bit of both. It's definitely like a respectful relationship. And and I think it's it's more collaborative than competitive, uh, but there's there's certainly, I think, some some pockets of, of competition or at least uh, tense areas of, of the way the businesses could pan out that um, yeah. are worth keeping. I, I, so what I was gonna, well, then why would Jensen Huang come out and say F, Tesla's FSD is the leader if that was the case, right? He would have been very careful about what he said there. Oh, there's a reason because they are and they're going to get the market and they're going to monetize before anybody else. And so what he wants to say is he wants to say that this is NVIDIA powered on the training side and he wants a yeah. piece of it, I believe. So I, I think he wants yeah. to be part of that story. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, well, NVIDIA is an amazing, exciting company. And again, the focus is like, you know, for years, it was flat. For years, it was gaming. <laughs> and then people, you know, would say, oh, let, let me go and, you know, focus out, you know, years ahead. And they're not realizing, okay, there's another product, another market. Guess what? That's what Tesla's doing. And again, people are not focusing on that. So let's move on to the next topic, the future for Tesla what they're focusing on, the uh, other announcements, uh, groundbreaking in China and Shanghai Mega Pack Factory. They also released the FSD miles, accidents per miles, which is incredible. This is by far, once you see this data, it's no longer debatable. AI helps save lives, and it's hard for regulator, regulators to counter that. So in terms of um, you know the future of Tesla, they sent out this letter to shareholders, as they have been, uh, motivating shareholders to vote proposals uh, for the two proposals, but they included this slide, which is our next growth vector is equally ambitious, and we'll also review what they accomplished in the last six years. But they're talking about the next phase of growth. It's going to generate significant additional value for stockholders. So it's just interesting for them to put this down. 
extending our lead in EVs through product and financing, right? Developing differentiated models, including more affordable options paired with attractive financing packages. Oh, music to all of our ears, right? This is increasing TAM, differentiated models, affordable options, which we've been waiting for, and attractive financing packages. I think that, that uh, that's a little Easter egg, guys. I think that's a little hint there, what this is going to come. Increasing AI compute capabilities. Uh, we grew our AI training compute by more than 130% in Q1. Putting the auto and automotive, right, 1.3 billion miles driven, on Tesla supervised self-driving technology software, establishing autonomous ride-hailing network to be demoed this year. Purpose-built robotaxi expected to be demoed this year. Optimus, the human and robot leading AI capabilities and designed for volume production. So many beautiful little hints here, guys. What's uh, who wants to address this first? I think a shot. I mean, start at the bottom. I, I've been saying this since day one of Optimus. Um, they are focused on something that can scale. And I saw um, there was an Optimus uh, at my local service center, and I was able to, you know, really get a nice close up look of it. And uh, this design for volume production thing is not, you are not hearing other bot makers talk about this because they don't know how to actually, I, I believe they don't actually know how to talk, talk through this issue and convince investors and others that they know how to do this. But I believe this has been ingrained in the Optimus team that they are designing for a specific cost target and they are designing for manufacturability. They're designing for serviceability. They're designing for uptime on these things and be able to bring them up very quickly if there's a problem. And I don't think others are doing it. And meanwhile, they've got a design for functionality. But that whole list of products, Herbert, I mean, they're literally swallowing other industries if they execute. So, I mean, you, you have ride hailing on there. You have the growth in, in EV where people just say like, look, like, you know, I mean, just try, try comparing you know, what you can get for the price of a new model three with comparable gas offerings. And it's just, it's, it's just not even close. Um, all the work on the AOS on the AI side. Um, so, and when I see this attractive financing packages too, I mm -hmm. what came to my head when I was signing up for Tesla insurance today is like, well, they have all my driving data. Like, why isn't this just one click and between FSD and insurance, you just handle it as kind of like, one one bundle and uh I, I and i see that in the future for tesla everything that they do everything that they enter into on that list on the left everything has a volume scale and a data advantage everything that they do has a volume scale and a data advantage they don't enter into a particular category or topic unless they can have a data advantage and a volume scale advantage because then they're going to win out on the cost side and then they're going to be able to deliver a net better product to consumers. If they know your driving data and they know they have an insurance product, they know how the car is designed, they know, and they've now designed, if you look how the Cybertruck is designed, it's designed to be more manufacturable, more repairable. Every generation you've seen Tesla iterate on the three and the Y, they've made it increasingly more repairable. And people are like, well, how, how do you say that? Like, you know, with these castings, like what happens when there, when there's an accident? And the answer is, is they've got reliability data that says like the probability of these things being impacted is, is, is extremely low. And they've, everything on the outside of the car is more modular and can be pulled apart more easily. So I think everything comes back to a data and scale advantage on what they're doing. And if, if you don't see that, then maybe the, it's, you know, it's not the right thing for you, but that's the thing I would key in on when I look at those, those areas on the left. Okay. Matt. Yeah, I mean, I definitely echo a lot of what Jeff said. I mean, um, you know, I, I was thinking about how they're they're going to compete on, on on the bot side, and and I think Jeff nailed it. Um, one of the things they've done so well is, like Apple in, in its heyday, they did the hardware and the software, and and they got them both to to really sing together. Um, none of these other companies are really doing that. I mean, you, you look at the um, figure AI demo where they they got the um, um, 
open AI essentially embedded within the robot. That was actually really impressive because it was able to recognize that there was an apple on the table and kind of use some impressive logic to hand the apple to uh, to, to the guy who, who was interviewing them um, or the, uh, who, would, who was interviewing the bot. And um, but it, like that's really just like open AI's <laughs> progress, to be honest with you. And then what Figure has done is, is they built a very kind of functional working prototype. Um, but Tesla is the only company that really, to Jeff point, Jeff's point, um, has from the beginning when they were looking at all the different actuators and they were saying, oh, like none of these things can really be manufactured at scale. So they designed their own and are essentially figuring out how to make these the lowest cost thing. Um, that, that, and that's going to create a, a durable uh, advantage. So just like on, on the FSD and RoboTaxi side, what's going to give Tesla a durable advantage is that they're going to be the lowest cost in terms of uh, cost of goods sold of the EV. And they're going to have the, the highest efficiency in terms of watt hours per mile on, on the vehicle. Uh, and and they're, I don't think anyone's going to be able to compete with them in terms of eff efficacy of the software, in terms of like safety and comfort and that sort of thing. But eventually that'll get commoditized. And even if you can compete on that last three and that, on that last point, um, you still will have lower margins than Tesla because Tesla is better at uh, manufacturing and they're, they have a lead in efficiency. Um, but I think that same thing is going to happen on on the Optimus, on the, on the humanoid robot side, where Tesla is going to be able to manufacture for a lower cost. Um, and they are really designing that way from the outset. So kind of I think they still have a bit to prove on whether their software can uh, really perform functionally the, the jobs with, with more economic value than, say, uh, something like an open AI um, uh, software package kind of plugged into a bot. But I, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that Tesla will uh, have the edge there. I want to uh, throw out some ideas here, and I think this is probably a bit of a stretch. But, you know, bear me out of it. Have a little bit of fun, okay? <laughs> so if you look at this, okay, um, stretch number one. What they're talking about here is significant additional value for stockholders. And so if I read that, that means that these things will all generate significant amount of revenue, right? Market dominance. So obviously EVs, they're going to continue to grow in EVs. That's straightforward. Uh, auto, auto uh, right? This is autonomy. This is a ride hailing network. And this is the bot. Just imagine, by the way, this is crazy, right? <laughs> These are massive, massive markets. But my stretch is if they increase, added increasing AI compute capabilities here, now I can see it. It's just, you know, it's going to obviously add market value to the company. <clears throat> because you're an AI leader, but <clears throat> could it also be a revenue generator? Like, you know what I mean? Every single one of these are actually going to generate revenue. So this, are they talking about AI compute becoming a revenue, like Dojo as a service or inference as a service or, I don't know, yeah. not a stretch? No, no, I think they are. I think they, they want to get it right for their products first. And, but like like Matt was saying earlier, these companies are, they're trying stuff, but it's almost like, well, we're going to try something to see if it works. You know, we can't just buy the competitive solution from the outset. We have to look like we're, you know, we're trying something, but I mean, there's a high probability that, you know, most of, I, I think, by the way, I do think others will solve autonomy in time. And it, there, there may be different solutions or very similar solutions to what Tesla is doing. I don't think Tesla is going to own this solution forever, but it's a matter of, and this is the debate I get in with some of the, with some folks on X of like, Hey, they see a, a, a four second clip of a robo taxi in China. Like, well, there's robo taxis in China. Okay. Well, let's, let's analyze that on all vectors. Is it profitable? What's the scale of it? Does it have the ability to, to scale even within the country it's in or globally? And, and, and what, what are the unit economics involved today? Even, even putting scale aside, like, are they even making something that once it's at scale could actually be profitable? And, uh, so, so back to your point, uh, Herbert, I think they want to get this right for what they're doing, but they're building a data advantage and they're building a cost advantage. And once you have both of those advantages, you have the ability to help others in a way where you can garner a margin, they can offer a competitive solution to their consumers and the unit economics work. Like they can make money, 
you can make money. See, if you go at these approaches the way Tesla does from a first principles, lowest cost perspective, you have the ability to put a product. I think Tesla could be selling inference solutions, for example, on the market that could be competing with NVIDIA, uh, you know, and this could be part of licensing FSD. So, uh, yes, I think it starts with Tesla solving for them for themselves, but it quickly turns into how can I make this solution available for others? And, uh, and that's the real scale that will, will come behind some of this. Yeah. I think there are orders of magnitude difference between some of the different opportunities too. Like, I mean, yeah. the robo taxi network itself is like a massive opportunity that that has the potential to, you know, be a, a multiple impact on, on the share price. Um, and then Optimus has the potential to be a multiple on top of that in, ter in terms of the upside. Um, some of the other stuff like um, Elon mentioned using the late, uh, using the unused inference compute that's available on the FSD computers as like a way to kind of do distributed compute and provide some services that way. That's a super interesting idea and it's going to provide some revenue. But, you know, I ran some like rough numbers and it's it's like nice, but it doesn't really move the needle the, the way that those other things do. So I, I think you're probably right um, that they're they're, they're going to look for ways to monetize these these other things, Herbert. But I think like kind of keeping your eye on the prize, like what really matters, what's going to be impactful for stockholders. Um, to me, it's it's you know the robo taxi network. Well, I think FSD is an ADAS system first. That's like the first little step. If you can increase take rates, that can have a very meaningful impact in in the near to, to medium term. Uh, but then launching the robo taxi network, huge increase in value, and same thing with the. Uh, with Optimus. These other things are kind of like nice to haves and uh, we'll, we'll provide some benefit along the way, but I, I don't think they're, uh, to me, they're, they're more like rounding error in, in the assumptions on the other ones. Okay. Okay. So stretch number two, <laughs> it says paired with attractive financing packages. I mean, they could have just said with attractive financing packages. <laughs> I'm reading way too much on this. I get it guys. Okay. Don't, don't at me. But I mean, I, I, I think this is referring to uh, bundling, right? Moving into a financing subscription model, but uh, binding insurance and financing together or something like that. But anyways, I mean, attractive financing packages, I'm so glad they put that in there, right? That that like, that means well, they, they're going to do just more. Launched, they... like the 0.99% financing. So, I mean, you could, could read it on a surface level to just be referencing that as a way to, you know, kind of increase that, adoption. But I think- That's only if they think, if that's only if you're saying that that was just a end of month it's spiff. This is probably a signal that this is going to be a thing for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. And and I, I think the idea of kind of offering some more services um, makes a lot of sense. I mean, if, if you can basically wrap the entire package into a monthly uh, subscription, include insurance, even include charging if you want to, um, include FSD, like that's a, I think that's a pretty compelling offering, especially in the scenario where, um, like you can actually be generating some cash flow from, from your vehicle. Um, then that's where the economics starts to look really, really attractive. Okay. And the final one, I don't want to belabor this point because it's just for fun. It says here, establishing autonomous ride hailing network, purpose built robo taxi. Why did it just say purpose built robo taxi and not purpose built robo taxi plus fleet? You know, obviously, you know, the fleet should be part of the red ride hailing network. I don't know what that means, but well, you don't demo a fleet. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I think okay. they, they wanted yeah. to make it a little bit more tangible. And I think, frankly, Tesla's gotten in trouble for being a little too ambitious with some of the stuff they promised. So, I mean, a, a, a purpose built robo taxi demo this year, like that is, that is, um, I think, more than a lot of people were expecting. Yeah. So, deliver on that. And I, I think it's, it's probably prudent for Tesla to, um, you know, kind of, walk softly and carry a big stick right now since they've been talking about how big their stick is for years and it never showed up. Well, this is how big their stick is. I love this uh, <laughs> table that they've been showing. More than a car company, we're not just a car company. Here we go. You know, the car is right here. Everything else around it, of course, is way beyond that. Um, any thoughts on this slide? No, I, I, I think they're it's, it's an attractive view for shareholders of like, you're not just in, cause it's, it's the great debate. Like, do you value this as a car company or is it so much more? And the answer is, is, well, it's so much more. Look at all the, the stuff that we're doing. And, uh, 
will be interesting to see how each of them, like what their ramp is to, you know, break even and profitability. Jeff, why do you think they have this statement here, maximizing utilization through software? Why bother put something like that right there? You know, one of the, the, after we get through this debate on how is AI being monetized, one of the other debates is, you know, especially when you're still in a constrained environment is, is if, if I'm, if I'm an enabler, if I'm, if I'm someone who is developing the picks and shovels like in NVIDIA and I ship a hundred thousand GPUs to Mark Zuckerberg, I ship them and I get paid for it. And you know, it's, it's, it's done fine, but that next order is going to come you know, based on how well that customer monetizes the work that they're doing. So how efficient is their engineering team? How efficiently are they actually using their GPUs? Like what's the instruction in, what's the output? How well are they monetizing that? It's, it's almost, you know, you can even look at their, their sister metrics around, you know, R and D efficiency on the OPEX side. So uh, I think this whole thing of maximizing utilization is like, Hey, look, we can buy you know, we, it's not necessarily a race. Like we have to buy as many GPUs as the next person is. It's more of like, based on the number of GPUs we buy, you know, we, we use them in a highly efficient manner. And I, I mean, it will be interesting to see if somebody lands on an industry standard metric around compute efficiency and around the cost structure around compute efficiency, I think it would be an interesting thing to study. Just like, again, many people study R and D efficiency of companies. And that's even a little tricky too, because not all companies do the same thing under one roof, but this thing is happening right now where people are buying training compute and they're buying perception or inference compute. And the question is, is who's going to monetize first and then what level of efficiency are they going to run at? Because if you're not efficient, uh, this compute is expensive and, and that would, that would not reflect well on shareholders. So I think Tesla's just trying to make a statement here of like, we're going to be super efficient with the compute we buy. We're going to run at a very high utilization. And if you do that, then your fixed cost for your network infrastructure and the, the associated product costs will be lower. Sorry, there's a lot okay. going on there. <laughs> I love it. Love it when there's a lot going on. I'm going to show another uh, slideshow here, but uh, I'm trying to make it fit here, guys. Sorry. Here we go. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I get out you're, of the you're, way. you're in the way. Matt, get out of the way. Okay, so Tesla uh, uh, posted this in in this first quarter of this year. A Tesla using autopilot technology experienced one accident every seven point six three million miles driven. The U.S. average was more than eleven times higher. Wow. So if this is supervised technology on autopilot, so not not uh, not FSD, right? So it is a, this this is the, what they showed miles driven per one accident. You can see in Q one. This is it, but you can see the jump. That's fantastic. This jump of how much more safer it is. So what we're looking at is the dark blues Tesla vehicles using autopilot, and then the light blues Tesla vehicles not using autopilot, and then United States average. So is this already at the point? Like first of all, they published this right, which is great. We want to see this. We want to see what they what they, it is happening with supervised FSD. They have not published that. But when you see this and they show this to uh, regulators, aren't we already getting to the point where this is pretty convincing that, you know, AI can help reduce accidents? So I think so, but I will say I, as convincing as, as the chart is, I, I still swim in enough kind of uh, Tesla Q circles just to kind of monitor what's going on. And, and even some like, like people who aren't quite as crazy as Tesla Q, um, but are just skeptical of, of those metrics. So, you know, I had an interview uh, a couple of years, maybe like a year back with Naveen Rao, who's like, I think a very reasonable, you know, kind of uh, voice within the community. And he's like, you can't really compare those, those metrics. And he went into like all the reasons why, like the U S average, um, like uh, driven miles with the older fleet with outdated safety technology, um, is not comparable to uh, Tesla when, when Tesla is driving a lot more on highways with the autopilot, presumably, and basically how it's not apples to apples. Then you hear other voices say, okay, well, like people are likely to slam on the brakes right before an accident and that might disengage like FSD or autopilot. So does that like count as a human driven 
uh, accident, and therefore it kind of artificially inflates the the numbers in there, which which I think is is actually a reasonable um, pushback, and, and it gets into like some of the nitty gritty methodology type stuff. Um, I'm assuming Tesla's like reasonable enough with their methodology to kind of account for those sorts of things, um, but I can I can certainly understand um, some critique if you were to try to steel man the uh, arguments why that uh, those, those figures might be inflated. I, th I think it's reasonable. You can find reasonable points of view that might suggest why that could be the case. And then on top of that, there's just like the whole like misperceptions and stuff. Um, I was talking with somebody recently who said that their friend had had autopilot on and then they took over. And then even after they took over, autopilot like took over and slammed them into a tree. Now, mm -hmm. I know enough about how that works to be like <laughs> like 99% certain that the human was at fault in that scenario. Um, but, you know, I, I think you you still have the, the perception still matters, even if um, even if, even if the the details and sp specific situations like that are are not accurate. Do you guys think that they they will release the FSD uh, data? Because that's what we're all waiting for. Is it not quite ready yet? Is that why they have not released it? What date? What data specifically are you talking about? FSD supervised FSD. They they should show how many accidents that that has reduced if they could. I think they want to get data on V12 and, you know, it's only been out for a couple of months. I'm sure yeah. they have data. And, and the question is, is, all right, you're going to show a couple months of this data versus years of the other back to, to Matt's point. But I think there's a way to normalize this. Um, and, you know, and Tesla does have a, a methodology for uh, disengagements. Like if you slam on the brake, there's a period of time for when was FSD engaged for, is it 10 seconds prior than it is counted, you know, in that. So they they have a methodology and I think it's, 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 it's actually above and beyond, um, what they're, what they're asked for, but it's some, it, it's, it's certainly a valid question. Um, so yeah, I think they need more data on the FSD side, but I think it's going to be a pretty compelling story. And this, you know, this doesn't get out enough. That's part of the problem. You know, every day you can see a car that's crashed. You see a car that's whatever, but you don't see the, the this uh, aggregated data that's put in. It, it, it's like it, it should be like in people's faces ad nauseum, to be honest with you. And um, and same goes for the for the crash related incidents where people are just getting up and walking away, which seems like a you know a fairly you know regular occurrence. Now, at the same time, there are tragic occurrences that occur behind the wheels of all types of vehicles, including a Tesla as well. So, but unfortunately what prints in news and what prints in video clips are like really bad fiery things. So I, we need more of this. We need the FSD. We need data. We need Tesla communicating more regularly. We need, we need the, the message needs to get, get out. And I think it is getting out. But I think it could. I think it could be amplified more, uh, because you still have senators writing letters to NHTSA, <laughs> you know. Here and there, you're gonna have whack <laughs> yeah. senators. There's a hundred of them, right? You're gonna always gonna have uh, a whack fringe, you know, writing letters here and there. But like, what data are they actually using? Is the is the question? Who's sitting down with them to go through this? Um, so, but yeah, if, if <laughs> Tesla. I'll, the other thing, is, Herbert, Tesla has to get outside of X. dot com. Yeah. And like, why can't this be on 60 minutes? Why can't, why is it the mm -hmm. Australian bullshit that was, that was shown a couple of weeks ago on old software, old technology? Like, why can't they get on to major news publications, major global, you know, uh, you know, platforms and talk about, and talk about the safety that is being enabled. But I, I think the short answer to your question is, is V12 is too new. They need more data. It's going to be compelling when they have more data. Yeah. And then if the expectation is 12.4 is five to 10 times uh, better in terms of uh, disengagements per, uh, per mile. Uh, yeah. And disengagements. <laughs> what am I? Yeah. The disengagements per mile, miles per disengagement. Anyways. Um, so that's going to be another thing, right? That's Herbert, huge... wake up. Potato. I, I, uh, I'm getting confused. Herbert. Okay. <laughs> Herbert, you need a Celsius. Uh, so this is the letter that they sent out, um, and just gorgeous. Look at this beautiful, beautiful shot. And can you imagine when they have like even, you know, different, uh, cars here as well, the, uh, the 
dedicated robo taxi, maybe a lower cost vehicle as well, maybe a van. That's why I wanted to talk to you guys about today. Probably it could stay. actually be a van. Uh, Gene Munster was talking about a van, possibly. So this is the letter they sent out, proposals three and four. Everybody needs to vote. If you have not yet voted, please find out how. And yes, I understand many, buddy, many people in Europe says that they can't vote, but just recheck again, because in just the last several days, several uh, brokerage firms in uh, throughout different countries in Europe have stepped up and changed their policies. Please check again. There are definitely people in Europe that are able to vote. We need you to vote. So this is- You know what I find interesting, Herbert, is, mm -hmm. you know, this judge, you know, is, is trying to convince us that we didn't know that Kimball is Elon's brother. Kimball Musk <laughs> yeah. isn't Elon yeah, Musk's yeah. brother. Meanwhile, you have what percentage of the in investor base that can't even cast a vote? That they aren't even able to vote. I mean- this is crazy. Like, why why isn't that case being brought? I know judges have to have a case be brought in front of them to act, but it, it's it's crazy. Like, the number of people that aren't able to actually cast their vote is crazy. I think Alexandra is doing great work. I think Tesla's, you know, trying to get this word out as well. And we need to unblock as many people as possible. I just find it fascinating that, you know, this this case was brought. And meanwhile, we have like this, to me, this burning platform of this high percentage of of long-term, you know, avid shareholders that can't vote. Okay, so Gene Munster of um, uh, Deepwater Asset Management, he's a Tesla bull. Yep, I think <laughs> I think he's a bull, right, guys? Uh, generally, he's bullish. And uh, he, he said this, he's expecting in the early robo-taxi event that there's going to be a van. Because you see here, there's going to be a van, not just the, uh, the low-cost, uh, vehicle. This is dedicated ro robo taxi, especially with the unbox model. They probably could. What do you guys think? Is there a chance that they would actually show a van? Yeah, I, mean, I think there, there's definitely a chance. Um, I mean, Elon <laughs> talked about that. Um, I, I, I kind of tend to think that the eight eight event is going to be focused on the robo taxi in general. I think it might kind of potentially confuse the message and, and you're also and with any product unveil, you don't want to Osborne the existing product line. So um, I think, you know, if you just display only a robo taxi and kind of show it moving around, like nobody's going to not buy a model Y today because they think they can buy a robo taxi ne next year. Maybe some very forward looking people will say, I'll forego car ownership altogether. because I trust I'll be able to get around and like autonomous uh, network. Um, but I, I think, um, it seems unlikely to me that they would unveil that until it's maybe a little bit closer, but, um, I could be wrong. They could I, do a soft sell like they did with the model Y. I mean, that was a very uninspiring event when they unveiled the model Y. And I think that was very intentional. Elon even, even said that was the case. Cause it, we know all, all know what a compelling vehicle that is. It went on to be the, the best selling vehicle in the world. Um, but you, anytime you're unveiling a new vehicle, you'd have to be cautious about not Osborning the existing line. I, man, I think this is going to be a right. This is going to be a, a, a autonomous car. This is going to be a robo taxi designed car. But it's just like, why is it so, just a two seater? Why not have a four seater as well? Okay, different form factors. Yeah, in, in that case, I could I could certainly see some. But Elon has also talked about making like the minivan cool again. <laughs> you know, so I, I I could imagine um, there's a passenger variant that uh, might look like some something like that. But um, yeah, and I could I could certainly see two different form factors of a robo taxi. Yeah, okay. I think the next generation platform, the Unbox manufacturing model, is going to unlock the ability to do multiple type, call them rectangular uh, type vehicles uh, on this platform. I don't think you're going to get a roadster out of it per se, uh, but you're you're going to be able to get a van. You're going to be able to get a robo taxi, a two four seater. Um, I do like the idea of them doing a minivan. Maybe they do a, you know, a conventional van, uh, you know, maybe they save that for 420. It's the Scooby Dooby, uh, Scooby Doo, a launch, um, you know, it's a Scooby Doo van. I don't know, but uh, I do think they're gonna be able to do it. And I think the unbox platform is going to unlock that and enable multiple, multiple vehicle types and, and I'll, I'll enable them to do it efficiently from an R R and D OPEX perspective as well as from a cogs and cost structure perspective i think they're gonna they're gonna get tremendous efficiencies out of doing that so 
I see it happening. Okay. I hope so. We'll see what happens there. So let's continue on. We've got, we've talked about NVIDIA. We talked about the future focus, F is the miles per accident. Uh, so Megapack factory in Shanghai started, had their groundbreaking today. This is uh, a photo, uh, actual work started happening now. Gorgeous photo. We know how fast they can put them up. Uh, do you guys have a guess of how many months before it's going to be actually uh, opened? I mean, what, what they do from groundbreaking to the first um, Model yeah. Y rolling off the line in, in Shanghai was like 11 months or this something insane like factory, that. This is a Megapack factory, though. This is a yeah, Megapack no, factory. This is a Megapack factory. It's much but easier. I'm saying that that's a, a reasonable kind of proxy. And, and I think that with their, their learnings from the um, Lathrop facility, I think there's a reasonable... Uh, like, like the the Megapack is, is actually a more easy to assemble product than a yeah. vehicle. Um, the, the amount of equipment that you're going to need is, uh, or at least the, the, the quantity of different types of equipment you're going to need is, is a lot more slim for assembling a mega pack, um, than like, you know, stamping out panels and then doing like a painting and, and, um, you know, coding and then like all the, the general assembly and welding and like all those different things, you're going to have like components, aspects of a lot of that, but it's a much more simple product, um, in terms of, of assembly, not that it's a, an easy thing to assemble by any means, but I think the level of complexity is lower than manufacturing a car. So I, in yeah. my mind, 11 months, 12 months is, is certainly within the realm of possibility, which is exciting. Well, this is Tom Jew. He said, Q1. yeah, first quarter of 2025, eight hey. months, guys. <laughs> well, why'd you ask me when Tom Jew already said it? <laughs> I know. Well, I was, I was testing you guys because uh, apparently you guys are not as... Uh, it's following this as I am. Come on. So I said Q1. Okay. So held the groundbreaking today, $200 million factory. That's so cheap, guys. That's a lot, a lot of money. Q1 started production, 35% quicker construction time than Lathrop. 20, 35%. That's significant. Capacity well, of 10,000 units is the same as uh, Lathrop, I mean, gigawatt hours. 10 to $15 billion of revenue per year from this one factory. It covers 200,000 square meters, aims to export export megapacks to overseas markets, including the Asia Pacific region, to support the green, green future. Ah, finally, it was delayed, but it's going to come out really fast. So glad Tom is back in China to make I, sure I this is point out how insane it is to have a $200 million factory doing $10 billion in revenue per year. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. at reasonable margins, the payback on that is just insane. It's like, it's like I don't know, like a week maybe? <laughs> it's crazy. I didn't even yeah. think of that. That is true. That is such a simple thing, isn't it? Yeah, and I think I think Tom, Tom Zhu back in China allows them to focus here. I think that the first affordable, these midterm vehicles between the 3 and Y and the, and the next generation platform, I think they will be developed in Shanghai and launched out of there first. That's the quickest path for product development and mass production ramp. So he's gonna be busy. So, okay. Why is it that people still think that Tesla is in a completely, you know, bad scenario, bad situation? Here's a photo of the semi. Pepsi's now gonna be, I think they're gonna order 50 of them or something like that. And there's 50,000 of them that they've uh, announced that that factory will start producing. And I get it, it's been delayed. Absolutely, everything was expected to be much earlier and here we are just now announcing this. But yes, the semi is now fast tracked. The Megapack factory is groundbreaking. You've got the energy just going, you know, is that one announcement after another? Australia keep buying more. You've got, uh, Robotaxi announcement about to happen. You got the bot Gen 2 was a launch and they're talking about a Gen 3. They're talking about selling it to customers next year. I mean, you know, they're hitting out of the park everywhere. Uh, yet, of course, I totally agree. Everybody knows that the biggest concern that everybody has right now is the shareholder meeting. And that is a massive, important issue. But everything else about the business seems to now be moving forward. Things take some time. It's been delayed but uh, they're not losing in EVs. They're not losing. I mean, yes, there is a, what is that, a slowdown in China and Europe, but they're gonna make that up with the uh, affordable vehicles and so forth. What's your perspective? Who? Yeah, go ahead, Matt. 
I, I mean, we'll go. Uh, so you're right on all those things, and also Cybertruck is is still ramping. Yeah. Um, so like that's that's another positive. Um, but I, I do think there's a very real, you know, kind of short-term risk things of of continued weakness. Um, I, I think investors should have a very um, sober uh, look at, at deliveries. I know Elon said that deliveries are definitely going to be positive year over year. Um, but you know, I think it's it's prudent to at least consider the possibility that uh, you may have a, a, a decline in in deliveries year over year. Um, so like when you look at the the impact of that on you know earnings per share and you know cash flow in in the the near term uh th there is i think reason for um a little bit of concern um in in the short term to medium term um this is not financial advice i'm a financial advisor but this is this is not financial advice um but you know i, th I think the reason that we're invested is is for the long term uh, but that doesn't mean that we should paper over the the very real kind of short-term headwinds that, that the company is facing. So I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not in the uh, everything's hunky dory and they're firing on all cylinders camp. Um, I think like they're they're ramping semi, for example. But um, what, how long until that's actually meaningfully contributing to earnings? Um, I think it's going to be a while before that that moves the needle more than say the the weakness that we've been seeing relative to what we all might have expected a couple of years ago. Okay, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, declining EPS, declining earning. I mean, uh, revenue. I mean, that's the problem, and that's the challenge. But you're right; uh, these things are being queued up uh, that I think will be much bigger than the earnings power of what's been what's been developed and built today. So now it's a do you believe it story, and and by when. Uh, but between now and then, you, you're going to have, you're, as Matt said, you're going to there's going to be pressure because um, the company is is earning less money they're spending more money too to ramp up all this compute so it's kind of a a difficult story as this whole spring compresses uh you know i think there could be some positive surprises that come out of this i mean they've done a lot of trimming on the opex and they've done a lot of trimming on the labor efficiency and improvements in the factory and you know so i think there could be some gross margin and opex improvements that start happening first as kind of a a telltale sign i also think Given Tesla's low network latency, their low development, their their quick development times, and their their really um, short supply chain, you know, from inbound to 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 outbound to the consumer, whatever this slowdown is in auto, they're going to come out of it faster than everybody. They saw it earlier than 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 most. They took all these actions. Everybody says no, there's nothing else going on in other auto. There absolutely is is bad stuff going on in other auto. Their rates of inventory are increasing faster than their rate of sales. That's a bad that's a bad sign. And it's not like they have re they had really low inventory like they're coming out of COVID. They're at pretty nominal levels already and they're increasing. So the short answer Herbert is, you know, declining earnings power will yield this pressure. The overhang for the for the investor vote will yield this pressure, but you're right. The the amount of innovation, the amount of stuff that's kind of in queue and ready to go is is pretty sizable so you you've got to you know you've got to believe that they're going to get there and the question is by when the final thing i'll say is and i and coming from tech and coming from supply chain when we set out to do something that no one had ever done before those schedules are very very difficult to predict and i'm not trying to make excuses for tesla but i think people need to separate like when tesla goes after something that no one's ever done in their category or no one's ever done ever. I would throw them a little slack. I know they've been uh, over ambitious in some of the dates and so forth. I also think that's, I think there's an issue with like what they promise to external versus what they try to motivate their team to do internally. But when you're going after these things that no one's ever done before, the, 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 the scheduling efficiency and the, and the accuracy also takes a pretty big hit. So just give them, just cut them some slack on that, but it is reflected in the earnings. It is a problem. It is a challenge, but I just wanted to say that. So I'm kind of in the middle, lower earnings power, great future ahead. And I would just say, cut a little bit of slack on some of these new things. They'll take a little bit more time, but when they actually hit, they'll be incredible. Yeah, let's talk stock market. And uh, it's funny, right? <laughs> we already talked about NVIDIA, but I put it in here. Tesla is 
uh, one of the worst performing continues to be con worst performing of the S and P 500. Uh, you know, you can tell us what's going to happen to the economy and the interest rates, but Nvidia is powering through. And many people think that and saying that Nvidia is propping up the market because they're showing that AI is a real deal that, a, you know, we're at the beginning of a massive boom because of what AI and compute power is going to deliver. Uh, and eventually Tesla will just join in with that. But, you know, NVIDIA is just, is showing the way. Are you guys expecting that the rest of this year is going to be a positive boom? Is it gonna be a flat? Or is it gonna actually set us up for, you know, a, 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 a sort of recession? It is a, uh, it is a political election year as well. Uh, what you thinking, Jeff? Oh, there's a lot in that question. Um, there, the economy, there are metrics in the economy that say it's stronger than people anticipated. There are all other, there are also other metrics that say that there are cracks forming, uh, in the strength of the consumer, uh, even in jobs, uh, there, there's, there's data and, and, and the consumer, uh, confidence, uh, the, the, the new, or sorry, the existing home sales just missed again. So, um, there's some, there's some mixed data and we had three uh, early months of hot in hotter inflation, I think than planned and then a decent print recently. So I think the fed wants to see a couple of, 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 of more kind of, co you know, pr cooler prints on inflation. We may see, you know, an employment with a four handle, maybe four one. I think that would start raising some eyebrows. So I don't think you're going to see like a meaningful amount of cuts this year, but I think the auto market needs, uh, they, it needs uh, a couple of things. One is it needs some relaxation from inflation because what's happening is, is all this other stuff that people need to buy costs a whole lot more money and they just don't have as much money for a car payment. And, and then you see the actual interest rates to buy a car. By the way, the New York Fed tracks loan rejection rates. And I think they've been tracking this metric for 10 or 11 years. And it's at a 10 or 11, it's, it's at a basically an all time high of, I think it's almost one in six. The last data point I saw were being go apply for an auto loan and they're rejected. So all these things, that could be one in six people that want to go buy a Tesla that can't get the financing. 80% of people that go, go to buy a car finance it. So it's a big deal. So I think there's some mixed data. You have an election year coming. Um, you've got geopolitical attention. Well, there's some articles last night about Tesla instructing suppliers of what to do, you know, outside of China, outside of Taiwan. So I think you've got a number of factors playing, but like I said, it goes back to, um, how Tesla has got fit on the OPEX side. They did some, you know, necessary reductions. I know it's painful for people and, and I feel sorry for the people that were impacted. Uh, but they're, they're got fit on the OPEX side. They're getting fit on the COG side as well by doing that. And the fact that they've got a really low network latency supply chain, they don't have this long supply chain with a dealer network and a really, you know, really long build times, you know, huge number of factories that they're going to be able to kind of spring in and out of, you know, any kind of slowdown faster than anyone. So I like the other side of this for Tesla. The, the market needs to decide, is it going to have a recession or not? Usually when you have this yield cur curve inversion for this period of time, it usually portends a recession, but this is acting very strange. There's a lot of money injected into the economy. And, you know, so long story short, I think you're going to see a very interesting second half of the year. Um, you may see an interesting summer come up. It's really hard to predict markets, but I don't think anybody predicted that we would you know, be S and P, you know, 5250, 5300, uh, at this point, the people that were kind of calling, you know, year end targets, you know, six months ago. So, um, you know, I, do I see us going up another 20%? I don't, I don't, I don't think so, but I think the market still could be strong going into the latter half of the year. Again, unless the consumer cracks, unless there's a crack in jobs, you know, I, I think, um, there should be some continued strength, but again, Tesla, I know I talked for a long time. I apologize. The markets are at an all time high and Tesla is probably what 50, 60% off of its all time high. So mm -hmm. Tesla has a lot of relative ground to make up. 
Matt, what's your yes. forecast? So I've, I've actually been working on a, a presentation for our clients recently about macro and some of these topics. And, and you're right, Jeff, that the signals are extremely mixed right now. I mean, a lot of extremely reliable indicators for a recession have been going off for like over 12 months, in some cases, two years, um, but we don't have the recession. And, and um, so it's it's kind of a, a question is like, is this the one time where a lot of these indicators are are wrong? And the yield curve inversion, the, the leading economic indicators from the conference board, all these things, um, which are are screaming recession, um, maybe we just maybe they're they're not right this time. Um, you know, in, in terms of uh, one of the other things that I, I found really interesting is um, you know mar markets being at an all time high. Well, if you're invested in anything other than the the magnificent six, let's call it, you know, the Mag Seven less Tesla. Um, then you're not really seeing the the kind of crazy returns uh, and all time highs that um, that we're talking about with with some notable or with some with some exceptions. Um, I, I I had this chart where I essentially broke out the um, the the Mag Six returns and then the, the S and P four ninety four and like it's actually pathetic how how like like tepid the S and P four ninety four returns have been when you strip out the Mag Six which over the last five quarters is up over 100%. So really it's just like those six companies have really been propping up the market, handful of other smaller winners. Um, but um, getting back to the point Jeff was saying earlier about um, Nvidia like selling all this, all these GPUs and, and there's a debate going on right now about like, is there gonna be economically useful stuff that's built on the back of these? <laughs> if so, then you would expect a company like Tesla, which is investing heavily in them to, uh, to, to start seeing um, some some returns on that on that significant capital that they're investing, um, market seems to be saying that they don't buy it, um, and and I'm pretty comfortable on the other side of that assessment. All right, so let's talk about your Cybertruck, uh, Jeff. <laughs> Tell us all about it. Oh, it's great. I, I, I I'll say is really quickly is. Um, I'm glad that uh, we're talking about a company and we're excited about a company that took the chance to build something like that. I, again, coming from, coming from tech and coming from kind of supply chain, coming from a supply chain background, I, when I look at that thing, I look at the chances and the risk that they took and I'm very happy to, I, I like high risk, high reward type things. And I think the cyber truck is that. I think the other thing, my other advice for people is, is it's one thing to see the pictures online. It's one thing to be able to go to a showroom and take your own pictures and look at it live. And it's another thing to actually experience it. I'm very fortunate to be able to experience and purchase the product. And it is the, I think it's the best Tesla they, they've ever made. And, uh, I, you know, I'm just really, I'm really excited about the product and also what it could portend for. You know, I was actually looking at it, I'm like, okay, you know, usually when I pick up a Tesla, I'm like, okay, I'm looking at the paint. I'm like, wait a minute, I can't look at paint quality here. There's nothing, <laughs> um, there's nothing Panel to look gaps, at. Jeff. Like, yeah. <laughs> and there, yeah. And there's some things to look at, but in just in general, like, uh, uh, it's a great product. Uh, and I'm glad Tesla took the risk and I think the reward's going to be there And it. You know, just, I think it's the best Tesla they've ever made. I think Elon said that as well. And, yeah. um, I agree with them. So Jeff just picked up his Cybertruck today. Are you going to remove the uh, side mirrors? Are you going to wrap it? I Potentially, I'll wrap it. I don't know if I'm going to be removing uh, mirrors or anything like that. Maybe. Um, but, I'll, you know, I'll probably wrap it. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. Right now, I'm just excited to experience it. I've been waiting a long time, like others. And I hope everybody else who's ordered a product gets it soon and and enjoys it, but it's, it's a really fantastic product. And like I said, the concepts that they can pull from this and continue to cost reduce and then put on the, the cyber, they call it a cyber cab for a reason. I assume it's pretty exciting because I think the durability, the robustness, um, again, you really have to experience the thing to be able to open the door and feel the weight and the heft of the door and, and just and you actually to drive the product. It's, it's a, it's an incredible experience. It's the first truck I've ever owned too. So I'm pretty excited about you know, being able to, um, to utilize that. Matt, you have bajillion kids. Don't you need to buy a Cybertruck to be able to fit them in? There? <laughs> no, it Damn. will not. There still no EV manufacturer makes a, an EV to, to sit my, to seat my family of eight. 
So if Elon wants to increase the, the population, we need that like Ford conversion Wait. van kind of thing. To, I thought to you had five kids. You have six kids? I, I thought you had kids, five yeah. kids. I used to have five kids, but now I have six. But have you Let's looked go. at the like the, if you looked at the bed, the volume of the bed? The, I mean, they could physically fit, right, Matt? We could load them in a there. Question as of cargo, comfort, probably. Yeah, yeah. You could stuff them in. Put the tiny down. Stuff them in. Remember the old days? You could go in the back, right in the uh, trunk. The bed. Yeah, I remember, remember bed. those backwards facing station wagons. I had a couple of rides in those as a kid. That was awesome. Loved it. Loved it. Yeah. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us. Uh, this was a powerful yeah, show. Matt. You guys are just, just tremendous information. Both of you, uh, really appreciate it. This was a, uh, you know, very important conversation we just had, right? NVIDIA and AI and the future of Tesla. And of course, Jeff's cyber truck. <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> need one, but he had to get one. He needed it, right? Yeah, it was nobody, a need. Yeah. It's investment yeah, research, I'm very, very fortunate. <laughs> Sorry. Investment research, right? investment research Ab yeah absolutely that's what it is thank you everybody see you soon bye, bye i've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the tesla investor please check it out simply go to my website at herbertong.com